I am Lily Cass, Upper Philadelphia's Scholar in Residence, and it is my pleasure today to introduce you to Carl Orff's Carmina Burana. In this video, I will share biographical information about its composer, historical context for its text, and a peek into what makes Carmina Burana one of the most popular pieces of classical music performed today. Karl Orff was born in Munich in 1895 into a family of musicians. His parents were his first teachers, and by the time he was five years old, he had begun to play the organ, the piano, and the cello. As he grew up and received further musical training, Orff's musical interests expanded to include German folk music, the modernist orchestral music of Claude Debussy and Igor Stravinsky, and 16th and 17th century dramatic music by composers such as Claudio Monteverdi. All of these influences can be heard in the piece or throat that is most famous today, Carmina Burana. The text of Carmina Burana consists of excerpts from a 13th century manuscript written in a combination of Latin, German, and French. In late 19th century Germany, as the nationalist movement was on the rise, many people began to be interested in the distant past of German literature and culture. This led to close examinations of medieval manuscripts, such as the Carmina Burana. Even in its 13th century form, the manuscript had musical associations. The texts were clearly song lyrics, even though most of them offered no clues as how the music to the songs might have sounded. Although the Carmina Burana is far from the only 13th century German manuscript in existence, it is unique in that many of its texts are secular. Although the texts referred to the church and religious practices, the main subjects of the songs were physical intimacy, drinking, and pagan ideas surrounding the allegorical figures of fortune and love. This unusual subject matter is what drew Orff to the Carmina Burana, and the variety in the texts inspired him to use a wide compositional palette. The cantata contains 25 movements, although the first and last movements are identical. It is scored for a large mixed voice adult choir, a children's choir, and three soloists, a soprano, a tenor, and a baritone. It has an expansive and percussion heavy orchestra, including sleigh bells, castanets, a gong, three glockenspiels, two pianos, and a celesta. Orff picked and chose which voices and instruments to use for each movement based on his interpretation of each individual text. The resulting piece is full of contrasts and is by turns dramatic and humorous. The raw power of Carmina Burana's opening chorus, O Fortuna, has been used frequently in television and film for both serious and comic effect. To name just a few examples out of literally thousands, in the 1981 movie Excalibur, one of Liam Neeson's first films, knights solemnly rode off to battle to the strains of O Fortuna. A 1999 episode of the sitcom Friends used the same chorus to accompany the deciding goal in an intense game of foosball between Chandler and Joey. And a 2015 Super Bowl commercial for a national food chain used it to announce the company's name change from Domino's Pizza to Domino's. Although O Fortuna is an important part of Carmina Burana, both due to its uses in popular culture and its placement at both the very beginning and the very end of the cantata, there are 23 other movements in Carmina Burana, all of which sound quite different from one another. Whereas O Fortuna relies on the full chorus and capitalizes on repetitious melodies and driving rhythms, the shortest movement of Carmina Burana, Dolcissime, features only the soprano soloist singing what sounds like a bel canto cadenza meant to illustrate the sweetness referred to in the text. The tenor soloist keens in falsetto, accompanied by a honking bassoon in Olim Lacus Kulueram, in which they take on the perspective of a swan that has been cooked for dinner. Even if the opening chorus may seem familiar to us, almost to the point of cliché, there is much to discover in a full performance of Carmina Burana. Yeah. 